Now I'd like to welcome uh, my colleague at CCI, Irene Karsten, who is uh, kind of the lead on all that is risk assessment and emergency preparedness at CCI. And she's going to be talking about uh, storage design and emergency preparedness. The title of my talk is Imagine the Worst, and you probably think you are showing the worst this morning. But Simon asked me to do a talk at this uh, workshop, at this little conference, about looking at storage design through the lens of emergency preparedness. And I put this up at the beginning. I thought, I'll start you off by just looking at some nice storage, the stuff you always dream about. But we just saw it, so <laughs> I don't, you don't really need this kind of a slide. But regardless of whether you get the dream storage that you really like, or whether you, you get a nice reorganized storage that looks great too and is so much better than what you have, all improved storage is good for emergency preparedness. And I'm gonna use the reorg criteria to, in a few of them just to illustrate this. So, one of them is that your collection storage area contains only objects that are accessioned. This, in the event of an emergency, helps, uh, helps you because there's no confusion about do I salvage non-collection versus collection stuff. There are no objects on the floor. Just raising objects, those 15 centimeters, like the bottom of the shelf in the picture, is enough to reduce damage from emergencies because we know water, which is involved in a lot of emergencies, pools on the floor. Every object has a specific location, and you can find those objects quickly. In the event of an emergency, this means you can find your priorities and salvage them quickly. Every object can be physically retrieved without moving more than two other objects. This just makes handling objects during emergency salvage all that more safe. So yes, what you're doing is great for emergency preparedness, but is it enough? And this is why Simon wa wanted me to talk and to give you context to why we are talking about this today, I want to tell you a story, and some of you may know this story already. It's the story of the Museum of the Highwood in High River, Alberta. In July 2010, it had a fire. It damaged the upper roof area of the building and some of the collections which were stored just under the roof, but they managed to salvage most of the collection and they only lost 2% of the artifacts. The artifacts were moved off site to a warehouse space where the recovery occurred. And as they worked through that, they were working with the town to find new space for storage because they didn't want to go back into their train station museum area. They just, it was refurbished for a museum, not for storage. So they were given space by the municipality in the Highwood Memorial Center, which was only a few blocks away. So not too bad, but they really didn't want to go there. That was not their preferred plan. They would prefer an expansion, and in part because the new storage was in the basement. And as you know, comes 2013 and we have the flood in High River. This is only two blocks away from the Memorial Center, which is essentially in the same area. And this was what we saw as we came into the collection storage once all the water was pumped out. The collection was underwater for almost two weeks. 80% of the collection was lost and almost all storage furniture was written off. So in three years, we went from promise to disaster. And so the question is, what was overlooked here? What was the key thing? It wasn't about storage design. They had nicely designed storage in that space. The key overlooked point was the fact that that new space was on a floodplain, and they put the collection in the basement. The museum didn't want to do that, but somebody decided this was the best thing to do. So what we're interested in at uh, CCI, and I just really started thinking about this two weeks ago, even though Simon asked me to write this talk, and I've never really talked about, thought about this, but how does this work in storage design? How do we think about emergency risks? Uh, what do we, how, do we, uh, how does the process get affected by thinking about emergency risks? These are some of the ones that we know can have a big impact on collections and damaged collections. I'm gonna to focus today on three of them, fire, flood, and storms, because we don't have time to talk about all of them. 
But we're developing these materials for both the reorg and storage uh, workshops, as well as the emergency preparedness workshops at CCI. To date, the kind of materials we have available are like CCI Notes 14.2, and in the reorg uh, workbook that's currently used for this project, um, it's, a, it's a tour, building survey, a bunch of questions that helped you look at a, your building and your site and your collection storage room um, from a, in, and identify the problems. And we heard lots of those kind of problems identified this morning by the teams that are working through this process. This is very, very good. It's all very helpful. There's only one problem, and that's, that is that it doesn't necessarily help you set priorities. And when funding and resources are limited, as they always are, we have the question, well, which do I really do? Where do I invest the money? What is the really important thing that needs to be done? And that's what I'm going to talk about today, is a way of doing that. But before we do that, you've been handed a small piece of paper, and I'd like you to think about your storage, and very quickly, don't get caught up in thinking about it too much, just decide how at risk is your, your collection in storage to these three emergency risks, flood, storms, and fire. And I've, we've given five categories from low, medium, high, extreme, and catastrophic. And just choose what you feel is the best fit for your storage. And if you have more than one storage place, just take one that you're most interested in. I'll just give you a couple seconds because I want a, sort of a gut current knowledge assessment of what the risk is. Because in order to set priorities in a, a reasonable way, what we want to use is a risk assessment approach. And to, in a risk assessment approach, we look at two things. First, how probable is it that such an emergency incident will occur, from improbable to frequent? And second, what is the impact of those incidents from minor to catastrophic. And we've done a lot of work in risk assessment at CCI, and from that work we can actually color in these boxes according to categories of risk, which you see here. From low risks in the bottom corner, little damage and very rare, through medium, which can be much more frequent but less damage, up to high and extreme, more damage involved, and in the very top corner, catastrophic, which you just don't want to go there. So we can use this kind of a structure, and I'm just going to take the words away and focus on the colors, as a means to think about some general guidelines of what you should be doing. If it's catastrophic risk, you probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> you want to avoid those situations, because you just keep losing your collection over and over and over again. If they are extreme or high risks, those are ones that it's prudent to try to reduce, okay? If they are medium to low risks, you're probably already managing them quite well. They could be reduced, but we always recommend that if you have high or extreme risks, you work on them first. Unless it's really cheap and easy and like just, yeah, you gotta do it. So the colors you just saw for the rest of the talk are gonna flow horizontally like this. And I'm going to use them to organize factors that we've learned through our risk assessment work are associated with risks of a certain magnitude. Um, and throughout, so you'll see these colors, and you'll also see the manage, reduce, avoid at the left. The category names are going to disappear, but you've seen them and you should sort of know them, so just watch for the colors. And on the other side of your piece of paper, you've got the same chart, but now it has the colors. And what I'd like you to do for the same storage space is listen to the talk and make an assessment based on what we know from assessing risk as to what the actual risk to your collection is in that storage space. Does everybody understand? Okay, it's easy. So we're going to start with, since that was the risk in High River. How many of you have collections in basements? Yeah, okay. Let's start with the worst case scenario. What is a really high risk with flood collections in the basement on a floodplain? We've crunched the numbers and even I was surprised how bad it is. It depends, how high the risk is depends on how often it floods. But floodplains tend to be defined about every 100 years. And so you can see that 
below grade on a floodplain if is almost a catastrophic risk. It is if it floods every 10 years, but you probably wouldn't still have your collection there if it flood that frequently. But many places, including High River, they're flooding around 50 to 100 years, and that is just at the top edge of an extreme risk. So this is your level if you're below grade on a floodplain. But it's not just about overland flooding. If you're below grade in low-lying areas, you may also be at risk from water main breaks if you're in an older part of a municipality close to the street, or from fault or sewer systems that can't take some of the torrential downpours that we're getting recently, and we've seen flooding like this in Toronto and Montreal and Peterborough in recent years. Um, so if you're low enough, you can get enough water accumulating in those spaces to uh, essentially drown your collections. Even if you're not on a floodplain, this, these kind of problems uh, can occur in buildings, um, but you just tend to get less water. And that's why the risk goes down. Now we're looking more at the lower extreme level than getting to the high level. And the picture here is from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal. Beautiful building. They can flood too. You can mitigate this kind of risk if you know the water level may only go one or two feet through storage, which is objects on lower shelves are water resist in water resistant containers or water sensitive objects are stored high so that they don't get wet. So you can look at it from that perspective if you can't avoid this. But of course it takes away from space for storage or makes it more complicated. What about just moving your storage on grade? Great idea, but if you're still in a floodplain, there still is a pretty high risk. Um, 100 years is still ending up in that extreme area because eventually the water is high enough on grade that unless you're uh, several uh, feet above the, the land, you're still going to get water into those spaces. Museum of the Highwood, by the way, their, their exhibit space were on grade, a little bit above uh, uh, grade, and were not flooded at all. So this helps, but it's still a fairly high risk. You can still use, here though, you're not expecting full immersion, so you can still use storage, if that's where your storage is, those same techniques to try to reduce your risk. And in this case, you can probably get it down into the medium category. But if you're not on the floodplain and storage is on grade, and or you're above grade with your storage, that's where you really bring the risk of flooding to your collections way down. So you can tell from what I've just said that you really need to know whether you're on a floodplain to assess your flooding risk. And what's nice is that more and more there are mapping uh, things available to help you determine whether you're on a floodplain. And I show you the Grand River uh, Conservation Authority mapping ha uh, application, which I've focused in on Brantford and showed you the location of the Brant County Museum and Archive to show that they are not on a local floodplain. And the floodplain is the sort of uh, gray area this area here. And there are various ones available. In Ontario, you have to go to your conservation authority to find the maps. In Alberta, I think there's some people from Alberta, the, the government, the provincial government has an application. So here are all the factors for flooding. And so you should by now be able to figure out what your risk level is and check it off on that little chart. The second one we're going to look at, emergency risk, is the damage caused by storms. And we're going to look at two kinds of damage, physical damage from wind and a little bit of water damage because storms tend to bring leaks. How big are these risks? I'm going to first look at the worst. Let's imagine the worst, which is storms that can cause destruction of a building. Uh, and there's really just two types of storms that will do this kind of damage. One is hurricane. It has to be at least category three or higher. Or tornado. It has to be at least on, uh, on a Fujita scale, an EF4 to a 5, to cause this level of destruction. In Canada, we're lucky. Nobody gets these big hurricanes. That actual risk level is from the northeastern US states. Some places it will be even higher. But in Canada, category two is the biggest we've had, and they tend to be, they'll cause a lot of damage, but they're not going to take out a building. Uh, but in Canada, we do have to worry about tornadoes. A picture from the Regina Cyclone of 1912 uh, showing a kind of building that today might be a museum and can be uh, in a lot of trouble. 
So who has to worry about? Oh, and I wanted to mention, look at the color. The building could be destroyed, but it's called a high risk. It's not up there in the red. Why? That has to do with the probability. Tornadoes have a fairly small path relative to all the land that's available, so it's not going to hit a lot of things. So the chance that your museum is actually hit is a, it's about once in 6,000 years is the latest data. So because it's so improbable, the risk level doesn't go higher. But it's still a risk level for people who are at risk of these tornadoes, which means everybody in an area of lots of red dots which includes southwestern Ontario, as most of you who live here know, as well as parts of the prairies. So these, in those areas, you're at risk for this, even though uh, the probability is really low. Another kind of storm damage that happens to some institutions is if, in areas of heavy snowfall, if your roof cannot take the weight of snow. Uh, and we show a picture of the Grand Prairie Art Gallery whose roof collapse due to snow load. And this past winter in the Maritimes has been quite a, a difficult winter for them in terms of snow loads. But building codes uh, account for uh, what uh, kind of snow loads you should be have to carry. So most buildings are okay this way, but from time to time if a, a roof is getting poor or, or rotted, you may have a problem for this. In most cases, however, the more frequent risk from storms is, is smaller damage to the building, such as damage to the roof, um, and then resulting leaks or physical damage if things get thrown around. In this case, your storage is only going to be at risk if you have certain characteristics, such as it's directly under the roof, if you have windows in your storage room that can be broken, or if it's on the side of a building that's close to large trees that can fall against the building. But you'll notice here, this is down in the green area simply because the amount of damage to the collection is not expected to be that large and, or that catastrophic. And most of it, in fact, will be due to leaks as water penetrates from the storm after the damage to the building. These are, can be dealt with fairly readily. Uh, few objects are affected and the damage is relatively minor. So the risk is manageable. And it also can be mitigated through storage design. So if you put objects in any kind of cabinet, boxes, or containers, right away there's a layer between your objects and the water or the debris. Uh, even better, if they're in water-resistant cabinets or containers, chances are you'll have very little actual damage to the objects themselves, and the risk drops down even into the low category. So these are the storm. Uh, factors and you should be able to assess your storage and where it fits on that scheme. Finally I want to end with fire and I want to start by saying that fire statistics show us that few fires start in collection areas and museums. They usually start in public areas or outside. So what we're worried about in, store, in, uh, in terms of fire damage to storage, stored collections, are fires that get out of control and that spread to take out the whole building because if they take out the whole building, they're going to take out your storage. So what factors are related to this being likely to happen? Well, if we start, oh no, don't do that. Okay. If we start in the storage room, a space that's at risk for this will have a local smoke alarm. That is something you only hear if you're there. It will have a fi fire extinguisher, if not in the room, at least close, and it's inspected annually, and the storage of the, the walls of the storage will be fire rated one to two hours. The building as a whole could be wood frame or wood clad. Um, it'll have fire extinguishers where they should be in the building. Maybe it's brick or masonry. Uh, there's a fire alarm throughout. There's an enclosed emergency staircase. Now, often it's under renovation or construction, which is a very risky time for fires. But I hope you can see that this is a pretty decent building. This meets fire code for life safety if it's an older building. You know, you're not being kicked out of a space like this, and we have lots of clients who have these kind of buildings. But you notice that they're at high risk for the big fires. About one in four or five of a fire that occurs in such a building will spread to take out the whole building and with it your collection, as you see in the picture, um, an institution in the US that was affected by fire. How do you bring the risk down? 
in storage room, it means automatic smoke detection in storage, because here what we want to do is, if it's going to affect your storage, it almost has to be a fire in storage, and you want to know when it's happening there really fast so you can do something about it. Even better, automatic fire suppression in storage, one of the best things you could do to protect your collection. In terms of the building, now we need to see fire rate not just in the storage room, but in the exhibits. Inspection of your electrical system every 10 years to make sure that it's in good shape. Um, automatic smoke detection throughout and monthly fire alarm testing. So you see it's not just systems, but it's how you maintain them. This brings it down, but still as a high risk. To get any further low, uh, lower risk, you have to change the nature of the building. Here you need to see no longer wood frame or even just normal brick buildings. You need a uh, fire resistive or non-combustible building, concrete, masonry block, steel structure. And you need an automatic HVAC shutdown so that smoke doesn't f spread through the whole institution in the case of a fire. And it has to be in a region at low risk of wildfires. So unless you meet some of these criteria, you're not going to get beyond the upper high risk of fire or even extreme. Okay. To get even lower in the managed risk level, you need automatic fire suppression throughout the whole institution and full-time security on site to catch those small fires early when they start. And this is the kind of thing we see, for example, at the Musée de la Civilisation in Quebec City that had a fire recently during construction on the roof. And uh, to get staff, together with firefighters, were able to manage that fire, and there was almost no damage to collections as a result of that fire. So here now is a summary of all those factors, and you should be able to assess what the level of risk is for your storage. So to go back to this idea, once you know the level of risk, you know perhaps how you should move forward. Do you avoid that situation? You need something different for your collections? It, is it prudent to re it reduce your risk, or are you already managing well? And we understand that even if you should be reducing that risk, and we, you've seen some different ways to do it, it's not always possible. So you still need to be ready for emergencies. Um, and here is our emergency planning cycle, which includes assessing risks and maintaining the building to protect collections. But it also means an emergency plan. It means a trained team and resources that, so that you're ready to respond to emergencies. And CCI is working for you to develop resources in that regard as well. Uh, we've developed an emergency response planning workbook that you can use to develop an emergency program. It includes details on building a team, developing a response strategies and uh, the kinds of resources that you need, including worksheets and a plan template that will make it faster to get this done. And we are very likely, I don't know if it's 100% yet, but going to be having this workshop in Ontario this year, fiscal year, so I think it's early 2016 was what it's planned for. So if this is something that can be useful for you, um, I encourage you to attend that workshop. Right now, these materials are only available through the workshop because they haven't been fully developed to stand alone, but that is our ultimate goal. What you've seen today is in development. As I say, I started these ideas two weeks ago based on what we know. Uh, but we're excited. We think this is, uh, this is useful stuff for our workshops and for you. So we appreciate any feedback. And I'd also be totally interested in what you found when you did that little exercise and whether there's a difference in what you thought and what you saw when you saw how we do this risk assessment. Thank you very much. So do, do go attack Irene during the coffee break with your feedback. <laughs> um, no, thank you very much, Irene. This has been, uh, this is, uh, these are great tools, and I, f I feel it's, it's a piece that was really missing from Reorg is, is how to deal with these, uh, these emergency risks. And I, I feel that the, the checklists that you provided are, are, are a great way forward for, you know, on a very basic level for, for some of these decisions. And I was wondering if, um, the if you had a um, you intend to make the the checklist available uh, or is that part of the emergency workbook or is that something that you plan to make available earlier than the whole issue of preventive conservation in terms of emergencies was part of my workshop that was not developed and so now i'm excited and it's going to be something like this so yes eventually it will be in the workbook i don't know exactly what form because this is pretty early days as i say cci people just saw it 
two days ago. <laughs> so I need to get some feedback and make sure we've got this working well. Um, it also, I think, is something that for you to integrate into your storage workshops or reorger. So it's going to, right now, it's not, there's no handout, sorry. <laughs> it's just not quite polished enough. But it's going to get into both of those workshops. So you'll see it, and as we refine it, and when it gets to a point that it can be a handout, it'll be a handout. There's uh, questions for Irene. State your name and where are you from? Uh, Elka Weinstein, I'm the museum advisor for the province. Um, I struck, this is a great tool, um, but I was also thinking about um, one of the things that we had noticed when we were looking at emergency and disaster plans for the museums that we fund. Many of them are part of a municipality. Mm -hmm. And um, although we had asked people to do standalone emergency and disaster plans, often people have difficulty doing that in the context of a municipality. So what kind of advice would you give people? Um, I know what kind of advice we've been giving people, but um, just sort of thinking about this in the context of that. Well, the first piece of advice we give them that when we define team, I don't, it's not the staff. It's the team is everybody who has to be involved in response. And that includes linking to municipal uh, people who are involved in emergency response. So our definition of team is big. And, and that's sort of the way in, which is you got to talk to those people. Your plan has to fit whatever those plans are. Um, so that's the main thing we say. Uh, the, in terms of the strategies, our focus, because we're CCI, is on collection preservation in the event of emergencies. Um, and that's not an expertise that the municipality will necessarily bring to the table. But in terms of the overall and who has to do what, we say it's the, the big team is everybody who's going to be involved. We do mention, but of course, the implications depend on the emergency. But we talk about the fact that in bigger municipal-wide emergencies, it's going to influence what can be done, as it did in High River, where they just simply didn't have access to the time, to town until the day before they pumped out the water, which was like two weeks later. You know, it, you, you can't you can't control the situation. So we mentioned that, but it's, this is still a workbook that we don't want it to be. Uh, I think it already is 100 pages long. <laughs> it's already big, and we don't want it to be so so hugely great. You know, we want to get people going and thinking about it, but we do tell them to work with uh, people in their area. 